Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for Zoom. We thank you for the privilege of getting together to focus on your word and your thoughts. We pray right now that that these stories, these events in your word would help us to get a better picture of you, also a better picture of ourselves, our natures, your nature, and just and just life. Teach us through your word tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're starting in chapter 22. Uh, David's running from the king, King Saul. And he's a man after God's own heart, which means that ultimately he ends up with God's thoughts. But he has, like anybody else, ups and downs and roller coasters. And we know he was kind of in a panic. He runs after Uh, he runs from Saul, escapes, goes, finds the high priest, lies to the high priest, and says he's has on a secret mission, gets Goliath's sword, and for who knows what reason, decides to flee the country and hide out in the, in the Philistine city of Gath. He spends seven months there. He's discovered. He acts like a crazy person, and they, they, they get rid of him. And he gets back to the mountains of Judea, and in chapter 22... He's in the cave of Adullam. So chapter 22, verse 1, David departed, David departed from there, escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers in his father's house heard about it, they went down there to him. So somehow, some way, he has maintained contact with his family. Now remember, Saul wants to kill him. So the way Saul is acting, his family is a little bit nervous too. And Saul now is basically after the house of Jesse. And we're not going to read, the, read Psalm 57. That is a psalm about David in the cave. When he flees to the cave. But Psalm 142 is a psalm that he wrote while he's in the cave. So he's in the cave. He's um, help, hiding out there. And Psalm 140, I'm just going to read this. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour, out my, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed and weak within me, when I walked, you knew my path in the way where I walked. They have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right. And see, there is no one who's, who has been for me. David is completely alone. And he's on the run, but now he's hiding out back in his country. And he says, no one has regard for me. No one is, cares about me at all. Escape has failed me, and I have nowhere to run. No one cares for my life. No one cares for my soul. And this is about as dark as you can get. Verse 5, I cried out to you, O Lord, and I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. If you don't feel like living, you go to God, and he helps you realize that your place is in the land of the living, and he'll give you the strength to do it. David says, give attention to my cry, I'm brought very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of adversity, out of prison that I may give thanks and praise your name. This is step one in honest prayer, realizing that we're no match for our enemies. Of course, our enemies are not flesh and blood, but David is saying, I have no way out of this. I can't beat this situation. He says, bring me out so I can praise you. Of course, he's learning how to praise in the middle of it. But it is a beautiful prayer to say, God, you get me out of this. There's going to be a great testimony. You're going to look good. That's how Moses did it. That was part of the relationship. I'm going to give thanks and praise your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will look after me. He said, I got no friends now, but I'm trusting you, God, that you're going to deliver me, and you're going to find the friends, find what I need to um, get out of this. So, we have him hiding in the cave, 
the family finds out, they join him. And verse two, this important verse. Everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. So a bunch of um, misfits collect around David. And it says distress. These are people that have problems, big problems. In debt, in debt here means they've been ripped off. And the implication here is under King Saul, King Saul is, you know, raising prices. King Saul is making land deals. King Saul is taking people's kids away from them without proper pay and joining the army. King Saul is doing everything Samuel warned people about. And then it says discontented. Discontent literally means bitter of soul. These are people that are crushed. And now let's put the picture in our mind of the king of Israel, who's my anointed king, this legitimate king, is David. And he can't sit on the throne, he can't go to the palace, he can't even show his face in the country, because the illegitimate king, or the one that Samuel told him he was going to lose his kingship, is running things, and he's running things terribly. He's hurting people, he's stealing, he's lying, he's not protecting people properly he's more interested in trying to get david and so if we apply this to a picture of christ today right now jesus christ is the legitimate king of this planet and who comes and finds refuge with jesus all of us everybody in the world that is in distress in debt owes a sin of debt of sin, that's discontent, they're weary in their soul, they're in distress, they're bitter. That's who runs to Jesus. And David is collecting people that are going to be part of his army. And they're coming to him, understanding he's the real king. But the real king has a long time to go. Now, every time David runs into problem, I can imagine he's hoping well, maybe in a few weeks or a month, things will get right. And we can all have thoughts like that, but um, good thing God doesn't tell David what's going to happen next because David has more than 10 years of this on-the-run life. They gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And they were with him about 400 men. There's about 400 men, and some of them are families. But since David's own family is with him, verse 3, David went thence from Mizpah of Moab. He went to Mizpah, this is a fortress in Moab, and said, oh, it's enter the king of Moab. My father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you. I know what God will do for me. Why does he run off to Moab? Philistines were the ones that were at war and always causing problems. They're the ones making incursions. Moab is behaving itself for the most part. And the He's saying, he goes to the king and says, will you watch out for my parents and my family? So remember, his great-grandmother was a Moabitess. And he's going back and he's probably finding some family there. And he makes a connection there. And he brought them before the king of Moab and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the fold. While David was on the run, when David was in, in the cave here. <clears throat> so David's in the cave. And the prophet Gad said to David, this is the first time we hear about Gad. Gad is a prophet, and Gad is a prophet for David, probably for the nation, but he's not recognized. Later on, Nathan is the prophet for Israel, and the two of them are the ones that guide David pretty much throughout the rest of his life. Uh, there's, we see no more time with Samuel. Samuel's going to pass away soon. But Gad, where we came from, David is acknowledging him as a prophet, and he said, David, abide not in the hold. Don't be staying here in, in this, this place. Depart and get thee into the land of Judah. And David departed and came into the forest of Pereth. So Gad is saying, you need to move into Judah. You need to move in closer to your people. Get into, I mean, it's your kingdom. And you should be not hiding on the outskirts. You should be available. 
Verse 6, when Saul heard that David was discovered, in other words, when someone found David and Saul heard about it, and that there were men with him, of course, of course, Saul does what he always does, sits under the trees and just, you know, eats grapes and holds a spear. He's under a tree in Raymond now, has a spear in his hands, and his servants are standing around him. And Saul is trying to get the troops excited about going to get David. He wants him dead, and he wants to get a posse together and take out David. He says, here now, you Benjamites. This is an indication how fractured the country is. It's still based on tribe only. Saul's a Benjamite, and he surrounded himself with Benjamites. And he's telling the Benjamites, stick with me, and I'll make you rich. And he says, if, da if David ever gets out, if ever David ever takes over, if David ever shows up, do you think he's going to make you rich like I will? Listen now, you Benjamites. Well, the son of Jesse, again, it's a derogatory term. He's calling him son of Jesse, meaning that, that you know, sheep farmer family. I mean, he could also call David my beloved son-in-law. They're both true. But he's trying to minimize David's status. And he says, will he give you fields and vineyards? Will he make you captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? He says, if David ever gets in charge, he's not going to treat you like I treat you. I'm going to put you in charge of armies. I'm going to give you vineyards and fields. He said, but all of you have conspired against me. And there is none that shows me that my son has made a league with the son of Jesse. Saul is going off the deep end. He's getting paranoid. He's accusing all of his troops of conspiring. And his proof is that no one in the troops told him about Jonathan and David. My son's made a league with, with the son of Jesse. And there's none of you that's sorry for me. This is very pathetic. Or showed me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as to this day. He tells the troops, my son has conspired to get uh, to encourage David, and David's trying to kill me. David's lying in wait for me. David's trying to assassinate me. And all of you guys, no one told me about it. Of course, that's not true, so that's probably why they didn't tell him. But David's going to assassinate me, and you need to... Um, Join up and help me get him. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which is over some of the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. Remember back last chapter, we had the dun 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 moment when Doeg was there and he sees David talking with the high priest. And he hears David say what he said the lie. He said, now I have a secret mission for Saul. So now Doeg's showing up, and he has um, a message. He says, and he acquired of the Lord for him. So Doeg is telling David did. David went to Ahimelech and acquired. He asked him to pray for him, and he gave him food, and he gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So I was there. I watched him talk to him, and after everything was done, the priest gave him food, fed him, and gave him a sword and sent him on his way. So the king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, and the priests that were in Nob, and it came all of them to the king. So Saul is mad. He says, I'm trying to kill Sam, trying to kill David, and you all saw him, you didn't tell me. But remember, David told the priest that he was on Saul's business. So the priest has no idea why Saul will be mad. And Saul said, Hear now, you son of a high tube. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to the high priest, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse? You gave him bread and a sword, and you inquired of God for him, that he should rise up against me to lie in wait as to this day. Why did you give him food and a sword when you know good and well he's trying to kill me? And Ahimelech answered the king and said, remember, Ahimelech, it's the first time he's heard of this. He has no idea. He says, who is so faithful among all thy servants as David? He said, he basically says, king, you're crazy. There's no way David's trying to kill you. He's your most trusted, most successful. He's, he says, he's the king, you're the, he's the king's son-in-law. He goes at your bidding. It's honorable in thy house. He's never done anything to hurt you. 
And in fact, you know, Ahimelech might still think that David was on a special mission. So he's doing the king's bidding. And so he says, did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Did I just begin at that point? Of course I prayed with David. Anybody would. He's the king's most, most faithful servant. Of course I prayed for him. I asked for guidance for him. Don't let the king impute anything unto his servant. He says, please, king, you can't say, you can't accuse me of anything to my servant or the house of all my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. So I didn't know a small amount. I didn't know a lot. I knew nothing. Knew anything about this. And the king said, you shall surely die. And I'm like, thou and your father's house. I just want you to picture Saul as a complete raving dictator madman at this point. Any bad news, the person dies. And the king said to the footman, the guard that stood around him, turn and slay the priest of the Lord because their hand is with David. And they knew where he fled and didn't show it to me. He's a stark raving man. He says, these priests, they knew where David was and didn't tell me. But the servants of the king would not put, their forth, not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Saul is, you, know, you picture him, raving man, kill the priest, kill the priest, kill the priest. And the soldiers are like, I'm sorry, they're the priests. That's not the same thing as the king. Um, it's supposed to be some sort of separation here. And they won't do it. They can't do it, which, of course, feeds Saul's... Um, a persecution complex. It, it frees his negativity. And the king turns to Doeg. Doeg's an Edomite. He doesn't have the same kind of restrictions that he would have. Why he's working there, I don't know. He tells Doeg, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg, the Edomite, turned him. He fell upon the priests and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Killed 85 priests. Just slaughtered them. And Nob, the city of the priests, he smote them with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children, babies, oxes, donkeys, sheep, with the edge of the sword. He just, he slaughtered the, the community that was there. This one guy. So it's kind of strange. The soldiers wouldn't do it, but they also didn't protect either. This is this, a status of when you're intimidated, you, you just don't do the right thing. I, I found out today the phrase edge of the sword is, is, literal, is literally mouth of the sword. The sword sheath and the, the sides around the, the, the blade were considered to be like a mouth. And the sword was the tongue that comes out of the mouth, if you will. Kind of like um, in Revelation, when Christ has, has the, the sword in his mouth. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahimelech, named Abathar, escaped. So there was a remnant. One of the sons escaped. So obviously, this, since the other ones are all dead, this is now by default the eldest son. And fled after David. So we went, tracked David down. Abathar finds David and showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And this is, you know, David told a lie. And, and David is going to have a rough time with that. But David said this. I knew it that day. Back when I was there, I saw Doeg. I saw the Edomite was there. And he was sure to tell Saul. So I have occasioned the death of all the persons of, my, of, of thy father's house. So he tells the son, the, the escaped priest, he said, it's my fault. My lie killed your family. Now, it's not a direct connection, but David told a lie, and it says here, he kind of realized at the time, he said, this could come back and bite me. And he takes, he takes responsibility for it. Now, the lie was that I'm on, the, I'm on a secret mission from the king. I'm, not, I'm running from the king. The king's trying to kill me. Same thing could have happened. The high priest could have hidden him, and then Saul would have gotten mad for hiding him or doing it. 
the lie was unnecessary, and it's we see David's conscience here. <clears throat> so David goes back to where they're hiding out, and the news reaches David that behold, verse one, chapter chapter twenty three. The Philistines are fighting against Kyla, and they're robbing the threshing floors. Remember back way back in the time of Gideon, that's that was their that's how they harassed the people. They would wait till they brought their wheat out to the public threshing floors and then just steal the wheat. You know, we'll let you harvest your wheat as long as we steal it during the threshing time. And so it's a small town. It's it's small enough that it has uh, gates and bars, as we'll see later. And David asked God a question. So here's the thing. Philistines are attacking the community. <clears throat> Should be Saul's job to deal with that. But David thinks, I'd like to protect my people. I want to do something kingly. David inquires of the Lord, saying, shall I go and smite these Philistines? There's an important concept here. David didn't hear the news and automatically assume that he should take care of it. Well, of course, these people are in distress. Therefore, I should take my men and go down and protect the people, <clears throat> rescue the people, push back the Philistines. Some people would say that's obvious. You should do that. David is learning not to always do the obvious. He prays about it. And the Lord said, yes, go and smite the Philistines and save Kayla. So David's got, David's got the green light. And David's bid said unto him, Behold, we're afraid here in Judah. So David tells his men, Guess what? The Lord told me that we can go and defeat Kayla. And the men said, and the men said, We're afraid. Now here's the thing. They're not afraid of going to battle. These are tough guys, and in fact, they're going to be trained and be some of the best fighters ever. They're afraid of, of being out in public. They're hiding from King Saul. King Saul is deadly. If they go fight a battle there, the whole country is going to know where they are and Saul is going to come find them. That's what they're nervous about. And he said, how much more then if we come to Kela against the armies of the Philistines? It's bad enough we're hiding here in Judah, but if we come out, if we surface, we'll be discovered. So what David does is inquires of the Lord again. Now, sometimes we've seen people do that, and it's like, no, you're not asking me a second time. I already told you. But this is humility. This is humility where David now goes to God and says, my men have these concerns. And in some ways, he's saying, should I include them? Yeah, God told David to do it. Does that mean God told him and all his men to go? He wants to get confirmation for his men. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. God gives an extra promise here. And the first time he said, Save Keilah, which may or may not mean completely destroying the Philistine attack wave there. But I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David and his men went to Keilah, fought with the Philistines, brought away their cattle, smote them with a great slaughter. And David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So, in addition to stopping the Philistines, he took a lot of their cattle, a major victory, wiped out a lot of them. And it came to pass when Abithar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Kila, he came down with ephod in his hand. Abithar now is basically the high priest because everyone else has been killed. <clears throat> and so, this is letting us know that the high priest, you know, arrived after David was successful. A high priest is coming to you know, take care of priestly things. And it was told Saul that David was coming to Keilah. That's what everybody was afraid of. Okay, Saul's going to know we're here now. I mean, they left their mark. They destroyed some Philistines that Saul should have taken care of. And Saul said, God has delivered him into my hands. Notice how a wicked person can invoke God's name. I blows your mind, I heard that when the mafia goes out to make a hit, they always pray that it's successful. They pray to pray to God, they pray to Mother Mary, and um, they want him, they want God's blessing on their evil deeds. And here Saul is like it's the range. But again, 
A double-minded Christian can think like that. And they can see, oh, here's an opportunity, and they think in terms of signs rather than in terms of uh, um, fellowship with God or in terms of right and wrong. And Saul saw, had a sign. He said, God has delivered him into my hands. He's shut in by entering into a town that has gates and bars. So we know Kela has gates and bars. So Saul says, let's get some men together, and we're going to catch him while he's there. <clears throat> Hopefully David's in there celebrating with them. And Saul called all the people together to go down to Kela to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. In other words, David knows that Saul's never far behind. <clears throat> and he said to Abathar, bring the ephod. Bring the ephod. You know, pray for me. You know, you know, function as my high priest right now. Give me some advice. And then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Here's the deal. David and his men just saved the city. If David stays in the city, Saul might come and destroy the very city that David tried to save. <clears throat> and, Dave has a, and David has a question. The question is, if I stay in the city, will the people defend me? Will the people give me up? And he wants to ask God this question. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up to his hand? In other words, if he shows up at the city and says to hand David over, will they, will they do it? He says, yeah, they will. And, of course, David is learning how to do good deeds and not be thanked for it. Uh, it's a thankless job. We just saved your city, but you're going to hand me over. It's not a time for bitterness or um, even judgmentalness. David needs to know this for, um, you know, tactical purposes. And the Lord God said, I beseech you, tell that the Lord said, he will come down. Which means that um, they, they will surrender. They're going to give you up. And the, David said, will the men deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they'll deliver thee up. So two questions. Is Saul coming down? Yes. Are they going to deliver me? Are they going to hand me over? Yes. And David and his men, which were about 600, he's picked up 200 people, <clears throat> arose and left out of Keilah and went with us wherever they could. They just dashed out as quickly as they could. What they don't want to do is give Saul a target. They want to protect the city of Keilah from Saul by leaving, just like they protected it from the Philistines by fighting. <clears throat> It's important to know which. And they departed out of Keilah and went. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbore to go forth. In other words, Saul gave up. Saul said, well, if he's not there, I'll have to track him down some other way. <clears throat> and David... I just want to mention the 400 men that David had, like I said, became 600. In First Chronicles 12, 18, it mentions David's men by the end of his, his, his um, being on the run. It calls them mighty men of valor, men trained for battle, who could handle shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. So this is the fighting force that he is developing. And we'll see later on that he actually starts kind of protecting lands and, and small towns, kind of like a, a, a mercenary group. They go through and they're protecting. And sometimes they do an exchange for food and, and, and supplies. But this first time here, they weren't thankful. They left. They got nothing. In verse 14, David abode in the wilderness in the strongholds. And remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Ziph is actually, there's a town in the area in the southern tip of the Dead Sea. It's a very drastic landscape. Um, lots of variety, actually, but um, lots of places to hide. 
lots of holes, lots of um, caves. And of course, there's, there's times in history when it was actually forested. There's uh, waterfalls and trees. Um, a lot of that stuff was wiped out later on. Like Ezekiel prophesied that um, the Negev and those areas would be completely wastelands, like they were at you know, the turn of the last century. <clears throat> so, so down in the Ziff, It says, Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hands. Saul is trying to track him down. He has people looking for him, spies everywhere. And he says, trying to track him down. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David's in the wilderness of, of Ziph in the wood. Jonathan saw Saul's son arose and went to find David in the wood. So Jonathan finds him. Now it says, God did not deliver David, which means God protected David. So God is saying, don't worry, David, Saul's not going to find you. Jonathan finds him, and Jonathan says, he strengthens his hand in God, and he said, fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. So Jonathan is also promising that Saul's not going to find you, and you will be king over Israel. And I shall be next to you. And that also saw my father know it. So Jonathan is saying, my dad knows you're going to be king someday. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's an obvious thing that Saul said to Jonathan, or it's just something that Jonathan is confident that Saul knows about. Saul has kind of put it together anyway. He's afraid that David's going to take over because he made that promise to his men or that threat to his men. <clears throat> but, but Jonathan again is confirming my father's not going to find you and again they made a covenant before the Lord and David lived in the woods and Jonathan went, in, went back to his house then the Zephites went to Saul to Gibeah saying does not David hide himself with us you know hey don't you know David's hiding with us in the strongholds in the woods in the hills of Hakila on the south of Jeshimon now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down. And our part shall be to deliver David into the king's hand. So the Ziphites are going to be turning him over. And if you want to write down, Psalm 54 is a psalm that David writes in response to the Ziphites. Actually, just look at something real quick there. Psalm 54. It says, Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, and give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have arisen against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. The Ziphites haven't, seek, haven't sought God. The Ziphites are trying to get political favors from Saul, the, the person that's trying desperately to hang on to his kingdom. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. He shall reward evil unto my enemies, cut them off in the truth. I will sacrifice unto thee, I will praise thee, O Lord, for it is good. He has delivered me out of all my trouble, and my eyes have seen his desire upon my enemies. So we have a picture here in that psalm of David learning to praise God before God comes through. It's a beautiful thing to be in trouble, pray to God, God helps you, and then when, after he helps you, you say, praise the Lord. But it's an even more beautiful thing to be in the middle of trouble and say, praise the Lord. Anyway, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to gain strength in praising the Lord. I'm going to take my eyes off myself and praise the Lord. And so, how does Saul respond to the Zephites? He goes, blessed be of the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many people praise the Lord for evil things? How many Christians are looking for vengeance, and when they get a chance, they say, praise the Lord. Now I got a chance to get even. It's not the Lord. 
He said, you have compassion on me. Thank you. You care about me. Go, I pray, and prepare. And know and see his place where his haunt is. And he who has seen him there, where it has told me that he dwelt very subtly. In other words, he's very tricky. He's really good at hiding. <clears throat> so you track him down. Give me a more precise location. Therefore, verse 23, and take knowledge of all the lurking place where he hides himself. You find him, you give me his exact location, and they come again to me with certainty. And I'll go with you. And it shall come to pass, if you be in the land, I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. Saul is obsessed. He has only one goal in mind. Kill David. The idea of taking care of the kingdom is not there. Only other weakness he, is, weakness he has is the snare of men. He doesn't want to look bad in front of people. And we'll see that God uses that here to save David. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness in Maon, in the plain in the south of Jeshmon. Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David, Wherefore he came down unto a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David after in the wilderness of Maon. So Saul is tracking him down. And he gets word. David realizes he's coming for him. So they're basically on one side of a mountain. And Saul went on this side of the mountain and David his men on the other side of the mountain. David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. And Saul and his men encompassed David and his men round about to take them. So They've tracked David. They know he's on this mountain. There's basically a ridge separating them from Saul's army as they go around the other side of the mountain. And I just want you to picture God told David, Saul's not going to get you. Jonathan told David, Saul's not going to get you. And now Saul's getting ready to get David. By sight, it is all over. He's tracked him down. He's been turned in. He's been betrayed. And there's there's, there's no hope here. But, which is a beautiful word in the Bible often, but there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, hurry up and come. The Philistines have invaded the land. So, for Saul, it's a very inopportune time for war to break out. But Saul, since he's in front of his men, and he has to go take care of the situation, he didn't care about Keilah, because apparently it wasn't, you know, on this on CNN, it wasn't on the news. He could ignore a small town like that. But now his army has seen him. He can't handle the fact, he can't handle his army seeing him pursue David and not protect the people. As a result, Saul turns around. He returns from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, they call that place Selahamalakoth, the rock of escape. So I want you to just picture that. David and his men are hiding in the caves at the top side of one part of the mountain. They can see the troops going around the mountain. They know the troops are coming over the mountain on the other side. And it's a matter of minutes before they're discovered and flushed out. And all of a sudden, they turn around and start going away. They, they, they retreat. They leave. The rock of escape. David is learning to trust God. He's learning how to be a king. He spent many years as a shepherd learning how to be a servant. Now he's learning how to trust God so he can be a godly king. So, verse chapter 24, it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines. So he's done, he's pursued the Philistines, he's pushed them back. His mind immediately goes back to David again. And it was told him, saying, you know, David is in the wilderness of Amgedi. Amgedi is a canyon that runs westward from the Dead Sea. There's, I think today there's a creek that flows down through the canyon. And back then, there was some waterfalls and other vegetation. But there is numerous caves everywhere. There's just caves 
you know, dotting the hills, the great place for David and his men to hide out, thousands of caves. Also, from the mouth of caves, you can like spot troops coming. It's a good place for centuries. Plenty of water, wildfire, wild, wild fire. Sorry, wildlife and fire. A good defensive position. So, David settled in now, on Gedi. Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel. This is Saul's final solution. I got 3,000 men, he has 600. This is five to one odds. This is it, we're going to get David. <clears throat> Saul took 3,000 chosen young men and went to see David and his men upon the rock of wild goats. That's the name of the place. These are the crags and areas. And he came to the sheep coats, the sheep folds, where there was a cave. So Saul is in the same area where David is. He tracked him down again. He's in the same region. And it says, Saul went in to cover his feet. This is King James for go to the bathroom to relieve himself. And this is a situation where he has to sit down to relieve himself. So this is a miraculous thing. It's not a coincidence. But Saul goes in privately, backs in, takes off his cloak, and does his business. And he doesn't realize that that's the exact cave, you know, one chance in several thousand. That's the cave that David and his men are in. They're hiding in the back of that cave. So they watch King Saul come in, and David's men get very excited. They're well trained, they're quiet. But the minute David said to him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy unto you. So apparently, <clears throat> the men believe that there was a point in time where God told David, Don't worry, I'm going to deliver your enemy unto you. Didn't say how, but they're saying this is that day. He says, so that you may do to him as it seems good unto you. So the men are telling David, this is your chance. Kill Saul. He's trying to kill you. You're fully justified in killing Saul. And David rose up. He moved over quietly. He reached out, and the cloak that he'd cast aside, he cut off. It says he cut off Saul's skirt. Um, this could be the hem, but it's a little difficult to think. He just kind of cut a two-inch swath around the edge. That is what it means, the edge. But if you recall, all throughout Jewish history, there was a tassel or a fringe on the people's clothing. And that tassel or fringe soon became equated with the authority a person has. Uh, the high priest would have a tassel on tzitzit, and that tassel was the authority of the high priest, the woman with the issue of blood. It was this tassel or this, this fringe that she believed if she could touch that, the authority of Jesus, whom she believed had the authority as, as the Messiah, with the authority to heal her of, her of her issue of blood. And it was that faith that Jesus acknowledged when he said virtue left him. So David is cutting off the symbol of authority that Saul has. He cuts it off in verse 5, very important verse. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him. His conscience smote him. I should never have done that. What? He cut off Saul's skirt. He cut off that tassel, cut off the fringe. He's very distraught by that. This is a man after God's heart. You know, you probably know part of the story here coming up, but the idea is that David is still living in the reality that Saul was also anointed by God. And David's heart is this. Yes, God's going to give me the kingdom someday, but I am not going to do anything to, to hurry that along. It will happen when God chooses to do it. It will not happen at my hand. I'm not going to, going to be the one that attacks God's sovereignty and attacks God's anointed. Saul was anointed, 
And if God wants to take him out, God can do it. I'm not going to do it. So that's the attitude. And we know that's the attitude because we're going to see it play out here. Verse 6. David said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. Is Saul, is David showing Saul respect? No. He's showing God respect and he's showing the office of king respect. He's saying the king was established by God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor the office. And so he feels bad about this. It says afterwards, so we're not quite sure at what point it really hit him that he should have done that. But I, I kind of think, you know, think of a high school kid that just does a prank and then realizes afterwards that was really bad. <clears throat> Except this is a grown man who he thinks, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something to dishonor him. And he realizes later that's not right. You recall in the book of Jude, it said Michael the archangel refused to speak against Satan himself. Satan had a higher rank. Satan was, had not, and still has not been cast down all the way. And as such, Michael, Michael the Archangel said, I'm not going to speak against him. That's a higher rank. Let God do it. The Lord rebuke you. Which, of course, you and I are in Christ, so we do have authority over Satan. But Michael the Archangel didn't think he did. So this authority issue is very important to God. Verse 7, David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went his way. So David could have said, I won't ever touch Saul. I'm going to be a good guy. I'm not going to kill Saul. But when his men offered to do, he could have said, yeah, I guess if one of you accidentally kills him, that'd be okay. Or allow them to do the dirty work for him. He says, no. You're under my command. Nobody's touching Saul. You know what? We're not the bad guy. Saul has spent all this time claiming I'm trying to kill him. Well, he's wrong. I'm not trying to kill him. Saul went out of the cave, went his way. David also rose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped. So get the picture in your head. Saul turns around, sees David, recognizes David, and the first thing David does is he bows with his face to the earth, bows himself, prostrate in front of the king. Hey, well, you know, that's a good time for Saul to kill him if he wants to. It's in front of the army, is right there. He bows down, and David says, Wherefore hearest thou, thou men's words? So, He's saying, why did you listen to other men when they said, I was trying to do you hurt? Has anybody come to Saul and say, David's trying to hurt you? Anybody come to Saul and say, David's trying to kill you? No. David's being kind. David's giving him the benefit of the doubt. David is, in many ways, giving him the finished work. We all know that Saul is lying as an excuse to kill David. But David says, why did you listen to the people that said I was trying to hurt you? You know, he's kind of saying, it's not really your fault. Whoever's been telling you these lies about me, it's their fault. I understand. I'm trying to give you grace, Saul. <clears throat> There's a question here. God has promised David the kingdom. So what would be so wrong about David killing Saul and taking the kingdom? This is a matter of trusting God and his providence. In Luke 4, 5 through 8, Satan offered Jesus the same deal. If you bow before me, you can have the kingdom. You can have it early. You can have it on my terms. And Jesus said, don't tempt God. He's saying, I will get my kingdom when my father gives it to me. Which we know is the point of, of the kingdom on earth, the millennial reign. Jesus said, of course I'm the king. I'm the creator. I'm, I'm the king. David said, of course I'm the king. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, the king's not, the kingdom's not going to become mine by my hand. And he explains this to Saul. 
He says, David says, who told you I was trying to hurt you? Behold this day, verse 10. Your eyes have seen how the Lord has delivered you today in my hands in the cave. And some bade me to kill you. You know what? There's some people told me to kill you. I'm not going to say who, and I'm not going to say how many. But yeah, so there are people, other people had an idea I should kill you. But my eye spared you. I saw. I saw that you were the Lord's anointed. I recognized who you were. He said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. He calls Saul my Lord. He calls him my Lord and anointed. Verse 11, he then calls him my father. Moreover, my father. He says, you know what? You're my father-in-law. You're my dad. See here. See the skirt of your robe in my hands. I cut this off. For in that I cut off the skirt of their robe, I killed you not. He said, I, 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 made, I made an attack on your authority. He's bowing down. In many ways, he's asking repentance for that. He says, know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. I do not want to hurt you. Remember, Saul told his army, David's trying to kill me. He's lying in wait for me. We've got to get him before he gets me. And now the entire army can see that Saul was wrong. But David's doing his best to not embarrass Saul. He could say, Saul, you nutcase. You think I'm trying to kill you? Of course I'm not trying to kill you. What's your problem? He could say that. But he's no. He's giving Saul an out. And he says, there's no even or transgression in my hand. And I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my soul to take it. This has been David's theme all along. What did I do wrong? What did I do? He's understanding it better now. He says, the Lord, Lord judge between me and thee. And the Lord avenge me of thee. But my hand shall not be upon thee. This is a strange little phrase. Judge between me and thee. That's a beautiful thing. That phrase is kind of like the covenant that... David made with Jonathan. Judge between me and thee. This is goes way back to what Jacob and Laban did when they 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 tabled their fight. They put this fight on hold. They said the Lord judge between us, and they said we're going to put a marker right here. He said we're not going to fight anymore. But if you cross this line or if I cross this line, then the fight's on. Right. We're going to judge right now. Make sure that we don't kill each other. So, then he said, and the Lord avenge me of thee. He's saying, you know what? If God wants to kill you, he will, but it won't be me. My hand shall not be upon thee. It's funny. Um, The Living Bible in verse 12 says this. Perhaps the Lord will kill you for what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. That's kind of unpackaging the whole thing there, and it's probably not quite that direct. But he's just saying, if God, if you die, it's going to be because God did it, not me. Vengeance does not belong to me. <clears throat> and of course, that's a good verse for all of us. Vengeance belongs to God. <clears throat> so David calls him master. David calls him uh, my Lord, my King. And the lesson for us is we trust God for these situations. How many people have had a bad boss? Was the bad boss trying to kill you? Well, if he was, he's still the boss. And we seek God's help. We honor. We build up. We honor the office. We honor the office of president. We honor the office of CEO. We honor these offices. It is God's way to let God take care of the situation, not us. It's not our place to rise up, to riot, to overthrow. That's not what Christians do. It's not our place, and it's not part of the Great Commission. It's just, it's not who we are. We need to get rid of those ideas. You have an issue with somebody because they've mistreated you, uh, a boss, taken advantage of you. 
you have to give it up. You have to give it to God for your own peace and for your own fellowship with God. So David continues here. There's a proverb from the ancients. He says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked. My hand shall not be upon thee. In other words, since I'm not wicked, I'm not going to kill you, king. <clears throat> Therefore, he says, verse 14, and whom is the king of Israel come out? Who are you chasing anyway? Who are you, who are you, who are you pursuing? You're chasing a dead dog. A dog is very repulsive in the context here in the culture. He says, what, what harm can a dog do you? A dog can't hurt you, especially when it's dead. You're chasing and pursuing someone who's harmless, a flea. A flea can't hurt you. The Lord, therefore, be judge and judge between me and the sea and plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. And it came to pass when David had made end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? He lifted up his voice and he wept. He wept and he wept and he wept. The first principle to learn here. When someone weeps, it does not mean they're repentant. Okay? When someone weeps, it means that um, uh, they found a way to get out of it. Important lesson. Someone says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and what, weeping and bawling. By the same token, some, a person could be sincerely repentant and not necessarily be weeping. But in this case, this is a show, but he weeps and he weeps. And he says to David, you are more righteous than I. Well, uh, duh. And you have rewarded me good, and I reward you evil. I, I'm so wrong. I'm so wrong. All the, the 3,000 men around me, they realized that, that I was wrong about you. And yeah, whoever lied to me about that, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll probably take care of that later. You have shown me in this day how that you have dealt well with me. For as much as when the Lord delivered me into your hands, you didn't kill me. You, you gave me a break today. I mean, he has to realize that David kind of saved his life. What if David hadn't been there and his men saw him sneak into the, back into the cave to do his business? They might have killed him and thought they did David a favor. Did Saul deserve to die? Yes. Does Saul, does Saul deserve any respect? No. But David said, it's not going to be my hand that undermines God's sovereignty. Just a powerful verse. He says, you know, I'm, it's not going to be me. Yeah, God might judge you someday, but that's God's business, not mine. Judging other people is not my job. So Saul continues with his, his whale, his amazing show of um, humility and uh, apology. First thing, for if a man find his enemy, will he let him go away? David, you're crazy. You find your enemy and let him go. What kind of person does that? Uh, a godly person. Wherefore, the Lord reward you good for that you have done unto me this day. What is, where is Saul's attention right now? Yeah, he's still on himself. David, you are really a good guy after all. Look at me weeping. I've been wrong. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I'm also very relieved I'm still alive. <clears throat> I mean, that's not the way you want to go, right? I could have been dead. Because of you, I'm alive. Doesn't change the fact that David is going to still be enemy number one because David is competing for the throne in, in Saul's mind. So, but Saul is talking. Let the Lord reward you good for that you have done to me this day, verse 20. And now, behold, I know well that you will surely be king. Saul says, okay, I've been fighting it, but now I realize you're really going to be the king. Doesn't mean Saul's going to love it and live with it once it gets away from David. But he sees it. And that a kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. You're going to be a king someday. So, <clears throat> like it or not, David's going to be king. Saul is weeping and crying and asking for forgiveness. And it's just kind of like an abusive husband saying, I'm so sorry, it'll never happen again. Please take me back. And if I'm being cynical about Saul, it's because of, well, the rest of the story. But check this out. He says, swear now by me. Okay, David, 
I've got your attention. I'm crying profusely. I've um, apologized big time. So now that I've apologized, uh, you owe me one. And he says, swear now when you're king, since you're going to be king anyway, swear unto me by the Lord that you will not cut off my seed after me. You're not going to destroy my descendants, my kids. Now, David already made this promise to Jonathan, right? But that promises to Jonathan and Jonathan's family. It doesn't include Saul and Saul's family, which would also include Jonathan. But David is very godly. He says, don't cut my seed off in me, and you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. Why is he praying this? Because that's the way kings did it back then. A new king, if, if it was a different family or a different part of the family, you would, you would assassinate and kill anybody from the old family or anybody in the new family that might make a claim for the throne. You just kill them off right away. And he says, please promise me you won't do that. And David swore unto Saul. So as you wrap this up, David makes a promise to Saul. When I'm king, I'm not going to wipe out your family. David, of course, is going to do his best to keep that promise. Much of Saul's family will be wiped out in the, in the battle. So David can make a promise of what he's going to do. David cannot promise what the sovereign Lord is going to do. Of course, David has made his promise to the best visibility for Jonathan. So now here's the interesting verse as we wrap up. Saul went home, but David and his men gather themselves back up into the hold. Why didn't David say, oh, everything's good, everything's all right now, let's all go back to the palace and be happy? Let me say it like this. God called David to show mercy. God called David to give grace. God called David to show respect and honor. God called David to, to submit to God's sovereignty. He hasn't called David to be stupid. He hasn't called David to, okay, assume everything's fine. David knows good and well it's not fine. He knows that Saul had promised not to kill him at least three times before. Oops, I'm sorry. I won't throw Jonathan at the wall against you again. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan. I will never kill David. He's heard it before. He's going back to cave. He's going to continue hiding. He knows it's not going to last. So, <clears throat> but these are all the processes here. Proverbs eleven twelve love covers all sins. First Peter four eight love covers multitude of sins. David is treating Saul with the finished word. He's saying, "I'm going to accept your apology. I'm going to think the best. Your God's anointed. I'm not going to undermine that." Doesn't change the fact I'm really trying to kill me, so I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to hang out here. I'll I'll stay with my buddies right now. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for these examples of David's growth, examples of things that we can all learn, apply, and examples of your sovereignty as you prepare David for the king, kingdom and kingship you promised him. So bless us all as we go our ways. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. It covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a straightforward <clears throat> narrative. It's just the, the motivations. And, and David's growing. But it's easier said than done sometimes. Always. Always. You know. Uh, I, I guess I, and I, this is kind of a preview of what's ahead. <laughs> also a question. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, you know, he makes a statement to the king, somebody had directed you to do this. In the future, there is an individual who was directing him directing the house of Saul to try to maintain their kingship. Right. 
that same individual is here as his lead general, right? I mean, I, I don't. I, it's not clear in the scripture as to when he became the lead general. Yeah, on um, this particular scenario was collecting three thousand men, so it doesn't say who that might have been at that time. Uh, I, I, very, very possible. Um, we don't have a record of someone whispering in a Saul's ear, other than demons, but um. I, I still think, in my mind, David deliberately is saying, I don't know who told you this, but David is, doesn't have to assume that. I mean, David, a normal, a normal person would say, what made you think I'm trying to kill you? He's, he's like, and maybe this is deference, just, you know, trying to, because when, you, when you're trying to accuse somebody, you're trying to, like, give them a way out, try to, give them a, a way to explain themselves he's, he's, um, but he David's position is one of legitimate honor and respect your God's anointed it will never be my hand that hurts you my men won't hurt you um, it, it's pure grace it doesn't deserve any of it so, well I agree with that part Yeah, I wasn't arguing that part it's kind of interesting <laughs> that what happens in the future right that same individual would probably be here now probably yeah and again david may have no idea that someone has been saying that too maybe he does um but it's i mean you know the, the picture we have so far is just saw becoming more and more obsessed more and more nuts I mean, let's face it, you're going to kill all the priests. I mean, that's really the, the height of his treachery. It's just, oh, the priest, you didn't tell me when David visited you, you're all dead. You know, they had no yeah. reason to tell Saul. They had no reason to think that Saul was that, that far gone. Uh, well, it's kind of like, you know, here at... Uh coming to kill the all the offspring two years and below on there mm -hmm. on there and i was thinking too we, i noticed when the i think it was edomites not edomites but when they came and told saul that uh dave is here on that and when he, saul decides to go ahead and ask okay if you get more precise locations let me know it's mm -hmm. kind of again too when the <clears throat> wise men came to jerusalem and here I said, go, let, let them know, you know, <laughs> right. so I can get my respects, whatever, on there. And then, of course, they let, didn't, and he goes and kills them, the babies. He would like to, yeah. Um, there's a, one of the themes throughout the entire Bible is Satan's attack on the lineage of Christ. <clears throat> and all the way back to uh, even Judah. Um, seeming to have a lot more issues with Canaanite women than some of the other brothers. But of course, the real prophecy is when Jacob says that Judah is going to or Shiloh is going to come from. The Messiah is going to be in the tribe of Judah. And so Satan wants David dead just because he knows the Messiah is going to come through Judah. That looks like the closest match at the moment. Every step of the way, you know, when Satan gets more information on where the Messiah is coming from, his attention goes there. And when it gets confirmed much later on in David's, um, David's reign that the descendant is going to be a biological descendant of David, all hell breaks loose trying to wipe out the biological descendants in the, until um, Zechariah, when Jeremiah declares that no biological descendant of Zechariah could have the throne, which confuses the Satan a lot. But that attack, and then, of course, as, as Philip said, yeah, try to wipe out all the kids we can. The goal is to prevent the Messiah from coming, you know, biologically, genealogically. And, of course, it was all for nothing because he came and succeeded anyway. But you can see, you can see Satan's insanity. So, yeah, it, that's part of this here. You know, Satan would much rather have a non- Someone not not from the tribe of Judah be the king because then he doesn't have to worry about the Messiah coming through that line. 
Well, that doesn't know the ending of the story completely because it doesn't know the beginning or the end. Well, still a created being, limited. <clears throat> yes, Janine, what's so funny? Yes. I, I said, yeah, he's just one of those created beings, just like us. <laughs> yeah. Just a little more powerful. <laughs> I like I like calling Satan a five-year-old with a temper tantrum and an IQ of 5,000. Wow, sounds like Trelane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> she was. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like, and what limits him is his insane anger, his lack of creativity, his dependency on humans to get anything done. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a rough job. So. It was all those demonic projections that Satan kept putting in the minds of those that he was using as puppets. Sure. The, yeah. the guy that actually went to Saul and said, you know, David was there. And mm -hmm. I mean, unless he was believing the, the lie that David was trying to kill Saul. It's crazy. Innocence uh, being murdered. So, well, at the end of this chapter, Saul had a brief dose of reality that he couldn't ignore. But as we all know, it's very easy to ignore reality once your mind's set. There's another parallel between David and Jesus here, too. Jesus truly was innocent for what he had to be punished, shall we say, only he went to the cross. David didn't actually get killed for it. What did I do? I didn't do anything. Sure. And Jesus honestly said, what, who of you accuses me of sin? Right. <clears throat> Yep, all the way up until his Sanhedrin trial when he did not respond to the accusations there. But at that point, at the right moment, at the right time, his, his, his mouth was, was shut. He chose not to answer his accusers because he was preparing to take that blame. And they accused him of all sorts of horrible things that are not actually specified in the scripture. People came and lied about him, this and that. And they, we have to say, you know, I mean, if they, they could have accused him of child molestation, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't defend himself because he was getting ready to die for the sin of child molestation. You know, the only time he opened his mouth is when he was commanded by the high priest, in the name of God, to answer the question: Are you the Messiah or not? At which point, one of my favorite verses, he says, "Well, put it this way: You'll see me coming in the clouds, like Daniel says, right?" That's my very excessive paraphrase. He says, yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'm coming back in the clouds. At which point the high priest breaks the law by ripping his cloak, ripping his robe. Mm -hmm. They didn't need any more false witnesses that time because Jesus gave the honest witness. Yes, I am the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Nurse for the blasphemy came in from the high priest when they denied that statement as being a true statement. Right. But the Pharisees had already been judged back when he told them they were guilty of um, the unpardonable sin. He had given them all the proper signs that they asked for for the Messiah. And then this last sign were casting a demon out of a mute person who was also blind. That was their final test for him. And when he successfully did it, they looked mm. in the eye and said, that was not God. You're working with Beelzebub, which is a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Right, right. So at that point, the leadership, the priesthood, Jesus said, it's over for you. No more signs for you. That's over. Um, he gave the people a chance to accept him in Palm Sunday. But, but that rejection in the Old Testament you know, dispensation, that was it for them. The ones that had done that. We know of two that weren't part of that group. Mm -hmm. But he's very serious. Mm. Getting back to David, Pastor John, I really appreciated how you were pointing out his growth, mm. where, you know, rather than just 
oh, you know, let me let me be the knight in shining armor and go and rescue those people. You know how he stopped. He was learning, and um, and I, you know, I look at I, him and Joseph. Joseph's story is so much the same, mm-hmm. where you know, and so much like Christ. You know, Joseph learned by the things that he suffered, which right. weren't even his his decision. Right. It is it is amazing to look at the Old Testament saints, Abraham, every one of them, and you see where God calls them, and then year after year goes and, and they're you know they're still doing the same old thing but then suddenly they change <laughs> mm-hmm. and they start they start talking to god before they start making decisions um you know, it's great yeah thanks yeah the, these 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 processes are they're 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 there for our growth and edification too mm-hmm. and, and that's why it's such a shame when some pastors today Dismiss or, or even denounce the Old Testament. Like, is this? Why? Their their example also shows us why should we escape not having some challenges and going right. on in Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. A lot of people may know God's called them to a certain ministry. Let's say, God wants me to do this ministry. But then what does God tell them to do? Stick with your job, stay what you're doing. You know, in this ministry, it can be a kind of a burden for a person. You know, God called me to be king. How come I'm not king right now? Well, because you're being prepared to be king. God mm-hmm. called me to lead the Israelites out of the Egypt. God called me to do this. Well, the calling is without repentance. That's not the issue. Mm-hmm. The issue is, do you have enough patience to wait on God to fulfill that calling? Yeah. Now, how many people have given up, taken things into their own hands, or ditched it completely? Mm-hmm. Just what a week before it was going to happen. Could have been. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, Stuart, any geological contributions or cartographic contributions? Well, I mean, we we were there in En Gedi where this is set. Um, and if you walk up the, the valley of En Gedi, you could see on the, on really, r- really clearly on the, um, and I'm not going to get my directions right, north side, on the north side of the valley, there's one cave after another. Mm. Um, as you walk through there, um, so you can see, and of course, our guide said, our our leader said, one of those caves was probably the one that they were hiding in. Mm-hmm. There is another valley right close to En Gedi um, where we drove by that we could also see caves of a similar type, and that is the other possible place for it. But En Gedi, the difference between that valley and En Gedi is that there was water in En Gedi. Mm-hmm. So it made a lot more sense for them to be hiding out in the caves in En Gedi. Right. <clears throat> and it's it's not very far from the Dead Sea. It's not very far from Moab. It's not very far from any of those places. It's it's really along the along the Dead Sea near the south end. And so it gave gave uh, David a lot of places to escape if he wanted to. Yeah, which it makes it all the more amazing that out of all those choices, Saul picked that cave to do his business. Yep. <laughs> A divine appointment. Divine appointment, that's right. Yeah. Even, even going to the bathroom can be a spiritual experience. <laughs> right. Wasn't that a testing time for David with his men now? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's why it's yeah, like, can you imagine? Oh, saying, to... Kill him, kill him, and then you know, yeah, David chose God's way. It, it shows they're well trained too. They they stayed quiet. They didn't start coughing and giggling or whatever. Amazing. Yeah, that was amazing that that many people be that quiet. Mm-hmm. Not really. If you're trained for it on that. Don't interrupt a man's business, right? Honestly, well, he made that army out of nobodies. Right. That's true. A right tag team. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's go back to that metaphor. 
the ragtag team that has chosen Jesus Christ as their king, even though he's not on the throne yet. Now, right. That is, we're betting our entire eternal destiny that someday he will be the king. It's a, it's a sure bet, I know, but it's still the picture there. They, they, we, literally, picked, we picked this to be our king, not the world. They literally bet their lives. Yeah. I guess we're betting walking, our eternal destiny. So. Walking by faith. Yeah. In fact, the people that they are betting their lives in many of our persecuted countries. So, well, um, with that said, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dad, you want to close in a prayer? Heavenly Father, we get some excellent examples of what it is to follow you by studying within how he followed you. And we have the extra advantage of the Holy Spirit in us to guide and help us. And even then, we fail. But we are thankful that you forgive us in our failures. And we're thankful for the encouragement and successes that you allow us to find us to apply these thoughts to our lives now. We praise you for this time to get together. I name. Amen. 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 Okay. Good to see you up and around, Mom. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, that leg up. Don't I saw, saw one of my nurses in uh, Walmart this afternoon, and it was so good to see us. She said, oh, you look so pretty. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, yes, I have come a long way since I left the rehab. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yes. Good. That, that's the nurse that I told us she left. In, how, what's the chances of taking you back to Idaho with us? <laughs> she was such a fun, neat, good, just a terrific nurse. Well, yeah, I guarantee really for the there. right price, she'll do most anything. She did well. They that well know them out of uh, their work zone. Wow. She just she had a, an unusual smile that was a brightness of every morning. Good. Well, she did well on the church stairs yesterday. She hasn't attempted the stairs here on the farm yet, so. Yeah, no. <laughs> but that's that's to she come, hopefully. Later. Okay, we'll see you all next week, everybody. Okay, see thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Thank you. That was Jermaine. great. It sounds like Jermaine's voice. That is. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs>